the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Judy Rubin, chairman of the 92nd Street Y, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight to the third evening in our series, Shape of the City. As you know, it is a series in which today's leading architects discuss the vision behind their work, as well as the challenges and problems they face each day as they create the environment in which we live, work, and play. The final two events of this series will take place on the next two Monday evenings, October 31st and November 7th at 8.15. I am particularly pleased to introduce the moderator whose participation in this series has done so much to make it a success. He will, in turn, introduce our guest. Paul Goldberger has been architecture critic of the New York Times since 1973 and its senior architecture critic since 1981. In 1984, he was awarded journalism's highest award, the Pulitzer Prize, for distinguished criticism in recognition of his writings in the Times. A graduate of Yale, he has been visiting professor since 1984 at that university's School of Architecture, where he teaches a course on architecture criticism. He is also a member of the Board of Overseers of Parsons School of Design. In addition to the Pulitzer Prize, he is the recipient of the Medal of the American Institute of Architects for his architecture criticism, the President's Medal of the Municipal Arts Society of New York for his efforts to save the Lever House, and the Roger Starr Journalism Award from the Citizens Housing and Planning Council for his articles about planning and air rights in New York. Mr. Goldberger is the author of The City Observed, New York, an, Arch an Architectural Guide to Manhattan, The Skyscraper, On the Rise, Architecture and Design in a Postmodern Age, as well as many articles in leading architectural periodicals and essays for books on the works of contemporary architects. He is now at work on a book that deals with the experience of looking at architecture. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Paul Goldberger. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Rubin. Uh, welcome to all of you for the third of this year's series of five evenings. I'm especially happy that our guest is somebody we have not had before in this series, an architect who's had a tremendous impact on uh, the downtowns of American cities from New York to Atlanta to Detroit to San Francisco and Los Angeles, as well as the architect of major urban projects around the country, and possibly the only architect of this era who has managed to create not only a series of significant buildings, but a new urban type. Uh, John Portman's design for the Hyatt Regency Hotel in Atlanta, finished in 1967, inaugurated a generation of hotels based on atriums. Uh, we will, I think, later in the evening explore the pros and cons of the progeny of the Portman style, uh, since it's now been imitated by all kinds of architects, many of whom have abused his ideas as well as used his ideas. Uh, his practice is based in Atlanta, where it has been for his entire life. Uh, he remains significant for another reason in American architecture. He's one of the first and today surely the most prominent American architects to have been a real estate developer at the same time as an architect. He has been his own client. He had a series of ideas years ago that he felt were too radical for the conventional developer's mentality. So he became a developer himself, became the client, and got them built. Today, Portman Properties, his development arm, runs a number of large projects all around the world at the same time that John Portman, the architect, designs them. Uh, I have 
Another reason for respecting John Portman, uh, before I met him, the only person of any significance who happened to have, who I could ever discover who was born on my birthday was Generalissimo Franco, which was not a very good <laughs> colleague. I then discovered that John Portman was born on my birthday too. He's some years younger than I am, but uh, we nonetheless share the same birthday. I'm delighted to welcome John Portman. Paul really is older than I am. I, I appreciate you admitting that in front of all these people, Paul. Um, Paul also instructed me that uh, this is not a time for lectures uh, and show a few slides and no more than three or four or five minutes and then we'll get into a conversation. And uh, that's the format, and I, I think that's a, an unusual format. I certainly haven't experienced one quite like it, and I look forward to it. And the main thing that I like so much about it is that I don't have to prepare for it. You know, I just come. <laughs> and uh, so uh, everything will certainly be off the cuff, and, uh, and I, think, I really think that's the best uh, anyway. I hate canned things, and, uh, and certainly this one won't be canned. So uh, I guess we can start with uh, uh, the few slides that uh, Paul said I could flip up on the screen here. <laughs> uh, this is, uh, of course, the Hyatt Regency, which uh, was designed in the early 60s and opened in 1967. And, uh, there's a long story about how that got to be there, and maybe we'll get into that discussion. And uh, this business of the atrium, which is uh, terribly misunderstood, and uh, is not uh, really, uh, uh, doesn't, uh, people don't really uh, know how it came into being and why it came into being, but uh, uh, it, it turned into a thing for everybody to grab so this is Embarcadero Center where we had uh, five city blocks and, uh, and this was put out for uh, proposals uh, by the San Francisco Redevelopment Agency. And I don't have a pointer here, but it starts with the hotel here and five city blocks. Uh, <coughs> And we were the only ones that made a proposal on the entire five city blocks. Uh, everyone else wanted to make a real estate subdivision out of it. And the longshoremen voted, uh, you know, they wanted a block. And Ben Swig, the Fairmont guy, wanted a block. And Alcoa wanted a block. And, but nobody wanted to do the whole thing. We were crazy enough to think that, you know, it ought to be done as a unit. And so we did the whole proposed the whole thing and the redevelopment agency selected us on that basis. This is an interior which I'm sure some of you probably are familiar with as the interior of the hotel at, in Embarcadero Center. Next. This is Embarcadero Center. It's really a, you know, the, our whole philosophy has been uh, people not things. And uh, I think architecture has suffered from a concentration on things and not on people and how people respond to environments and what kind of lifestyle is created by what you build. And our whole philosophy and approach has been the other way around, is trying to understand what the innate reactions uh, of people to environmental circumstances and how can we create the kinds of things that you find in Europe, like in the uh, Piazza San Marco. Uh, in San Francisco, we have a Piazza San Marco. It's uh, Justin Herman Park, which is at the end. Uh, but people uh, become uh, really the, the, the thrust of the whole thing. Next. Uh, this, is a, one of the, this is a Merritt Marquis in Atlanta, which is the latest hotel that we did in Atlanta. Next. You know, I could get into each one of these things, but Paul's only given me a few minutes. This is San Francisco. Uh, this is the Portman Hotel, which is the first one that I have uh, done where we formed our own hotel company and we're running and operating this. 
uh, as an affiliate of the Peninsula Hotel out of uh, a group out of uh, uh, Hong Kong. And uh, this design grew out of the uh, surrounding neighborhood. And, and because the land was leased from the, the uh, uh, Olympic Club next door, uh, one of the things, and they had uh, many people doing this, was they wanted something that would respect uh, the Olympic Club. And unfortunately, this slide didn't show the Olympic Club next door, but you would see how everything begins to grow out of the environment. Next <clears throat> interior of that hotel, which is small for us, 350 rooms, uh, which is the smallest hotel I guess we've ever done. Uh, next. Most people don't realize, but we do, we've done a lot of uh, other things other than hotels. This is a, a student union building uh, in, uh, for Emory University. Uh, and uh, the facade over here uh, was the original student union building, and we had to adjoin that. And uh, the problem was how to preserve that and add on to it and add a new and solve all the problems related to it. And uh, I was uh, struggling with this when I was in uh, Vincenza and saw Palladio's uh, uh, Olympico and uh, Eureka there. I don't know if you're familiar with the Olympico. Uh, the stage backdrop of the, of the thing and, and the terraced uh, 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 student dining. And this becomes a living room for the whole campus and then the stage is in the middle where the door is and they have theatrical and uh, events here and it becomes a theater, it becomes a living room for the campus, it becomes a lot of things happening. And so it, it goes beyond just a dining room and a, you know, it begins to get into how people react and function within an environment and what kind of contribution you can make so that it, that, uh, uh, it really uh, moves from being a functional thing to having a, a serious and meaningful impact on lifestyle. And that's the next. <clears throat> uh, this is just some other photographs of that building. Next. Uh, we were asked by David Rockefeller when he retired from Chase Manhattan Bank uh, to come and look at the rink and what was happening underneath the rink. And uh, I realized that the rink was the heart and soul of Rockefeller Center. And I, but when you got down in there, I mean, you lost it. You couldn't see the rink. I mean, you know, it was... Uh, dreary and dark and and black granite and dark stones and all that. <clears throat> and so uh, we went down and next. Uh, we created, in, in a sense, a glass screen uh, and had functions happen between the glass screen and the rink, uh, which let you be completely aware uh, as you are in the lower levels of what's of the rink. And uh, you see through and you see the activities and the whole thing goes from dark to light. And uh, the business of uh, creating, since you're down below street level, light becomes uh, very, very important and you go from dark to light and you, you don't have that feeling of being underground. Next. Some details of the development underneath. Next. This is a, a little beach cottage that, that I did, <laughs> uh, which I had a lot of fun with. And Paul came down and saw this. And I don't remember any of his comments because he didn't make many. He just, uh, he never does, you know. <laughs> he waits till he gets his pen. <laughs> but uh, I had a lot of fun with this. And I really, uh, 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 used it as, uh, you know, in, in, in industry they have R&D and in a sense uh, this was R&D uh, and I think that an architect when he's doing something for himself should operate on himself and uh, if you want to explore and, uh, and, and really push to the outer limits of things, uh, uh, then do it to yourself. Don't do it to some unsuspecting client. 
and then hand him a bill for it. So I, you know, I, I, I did this, and, and uh, it was a lot of fun. And uh, <clears throat> out of this uh, uh, has come a lot. I did the sculpture, which came out of the uh, of trying to bring art and architecture and sculpture growing out of architecture and the art being indigenous to the architecture and all of this. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and the painting, uh, I'm into painting and sculpture as well as architecture. And being able to integrate all this into one, one thing and also not being under time pressures uh, because I played around with this, you know. And uh, <clears throat> uh, being able to think uh, unfortunately, in, in, in the real world, you're always uh, with your nose to the grindstone and you're always uh, having to meet a deadline and, uh, you know, and, and, and consequently the thinking time gets abbreviated and this, in this case, uh, I had an opportunity to do it at my, at, at my tempo uh, and, uh, and I could put it back on the shelf and bring it off when I wanted to and it didn't have other things uh, really uh, affecting that. And uh, it was really an exploration. An exploration because I have been very, very unhappy about the direction of architecture. Uh, having come out of World War II uh, and into architecture and going through the Bauhaus movement and, and where less is more and where back in those days we had to find out, you know, how can we maximize a four by eight piece of plywood? And, uh, you know, it wasn't a question of, it, it was an economy of means to ends. Uh, we had classrooms to build, we had housings to build, we had uh, all these people coming back and uh, this whole philosophy of providing for the basics uh, uh, drove us into uh, creating basics and thinking mainly in terms of, uh, of things. Uh, next. <clears throat> This is more photographs of the beach house. Uh, next, uh, furniture design. You know, I, I've gotten into furniture design and and, and sculpture and, and uh, 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 glass. Uh, uh, next, uh, this is a major sculpture that's 45 feet high. Uh, all the forms taken from the architecture. And uh, this is uh, the sculpture related to it. Next. This is a, this is a project which we're doing in Shanghai and, uh, and I was invited to, uh, uh, to China by Dong Xiaoping. Uh, he came to this country in 79 when, when uh, Jimmy Carter was president and uh, came to Atlanta and I had the opportunity of of uh, meeting him and um, <clears throat> and uh, I went over with the governor and about six people as the guest in 1979 of uh, of Deng Xiaoping and uh, to try to come up with a uh, a scheme that would open up uh, China to the Western world and. Uh, this is, in a sense, kind of like an outpost, like in the old Western days where you had uh, had the outpost and the Indians, in a sense. But what what this is is uh, a place where uh, the whole Western world can penetrate. We have office space, we have housing, we have a major hotel, we have a 1,200-seat a, a cultural theater. Uh, we have exhibition halls, we have a, a, a retail village which includes uh, multi-use uh, kind of activities so that, for instance, in food, you get tired in China of eating Chinese food all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and so if, uh, for instance, if Citicor wants to go, or any, any company in the Western world wants to penetrate China, this is, they can come in with a very few people, we're in a small office space, we can house them, uh, give them office space, and, and then as they understand and figure out how things work in China, then they can move out of this and, and go and do their own thing. And so this is, and since we've done this, this is will open in about uh, uh, another 15 months. It's already topped out. And uh, 
Uh, we are now in discussions uh, with the Russians to do a similar kind of, uh, of penetration point in, in, in Moscow. Next. This is a major tower that we're doing to add to Peachtree Center. In Atlanta, we have a development there that involves 15 city blocks, which over time we are integrating and tying in. And, and you know, one of the hardest things in the world is, and this goes back to 1959 when we started all this, pro, all, all this thing, uh, uh, is how do, you, uh, how do you keep the thing together? And when you analyze what has made cities great in the past, whether it's Paris, the hill towns of Italy, or southern France, or whatever, there, there are certain fundamentals that pop out at you, and, and they are uh, really uh, a commonality of scale, a commonality of color, a commonality of materials, uh, a commonality of form, their form relationships. And, and uh, that makes a city. Each building necessarily doesn't stand out by itself. It becomes a fabric. And that's what we've been involved in, is trying to do the fabric and the tremendous uh, restraint problem uh, of over time uh, with the changing things. And we live in a very fast-changing society. Uh, and, and everything, because we are a media-oriented society and information becomes overnight, um, it's very difficult, uh, really, to keep something uh, like architecture uh, in a way that's going to cause a, and create a cohesiveness uh, that's going to be beneficial over time because the tendency is, is, is that, you know, the latest thing, you know, if, if, for instance, if you wiped all the buildings off the blocks and you put a different architect on every corner and gave him a different musical instrument and each one's doing his own thing uh, without any regard to the next guy, you can imagine what kind of music's coming out of that. And, and that's really uh, what's been happening uh, in our society. And, and uh, you know, when uh, Houseman uh, laid down all the rules for Paris and uh, uh, established all the building heights and the building materials and, and the relationships and whatnot and let and it created a wonderful thing uh, because each building doesn't become uh, an icon that's constantly uh, uh, trying to be the icon. Uh, we have a society that everything wants to be the icon. Next. Uh, this is a building, you know, and I, one of the things that I, I've been very frustrated with, and having come through the, uh, the Bauhaus uh, era, uh, and uh, I've been very, very frustrated with the postmodern thing, and because I find it arbitrary, I find it surface, I find it superficial, I find it shallow. Uh, 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 you know, modern architecture turned its back on uh, on uh, history, but postmodern has turned its back on the future, and 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 consequently, there is there are lessons to be learned. One of the things that comes out, and if you go back to Hegel with the thesis and antithesis and synthesis, uh, and say, okay, there's got to be some good about postmodern, uh, and and what is the good? The good, the good, I think, is. Uh, is that it, it's made us think more in terms of enrichment. And if you, if you go back to, to, to modern and after the World War and so forth, and everything was less is more and minimalism and so forth and so on, just to get the space built and provide the space for the function. Uh, then you get into uh, uh, the idea of enrichment was, you know, that was, that was, Ornament is a crime, as Lou said. You know, so so I think what what uh, postmodern has done has made us realize that you know there is a value to enrichment, and consequently uh, we find an acceptance of enrichment again, which was not there before really. 
And it was, even when we were in the old days trying to add enrichment, we were given all kinds of pragmatic reasons of why we were trying to do it. We never really told them the real truth. And uh, now it's, it's more, it's expected now. And so out of that, I think, I think that's, uh, that's been a positive effect. And so what I think is that I'm, I'm seeking a new synthesis, a synthesis that that accepts the good of what came out of the whole Bauhaus movement and international architecture and that whole era. There, there's an awful lot of good there. And, and, uh, and to take that and in some way find the faults related to that and the things that the human being didn't react to. And I, and I can tell you that in the old days, everybody was telling modern architecture is cold. You know, I mean, the layman was telling us all the time, but we were saying that they were intellectually, they just didn't understand. And we kept throwing it at them, you know? And, and they really uh, uh, didn't like it. And so that begins to tell you, but there were an awful lot of good about it. And the truth is, is that somewhere in between here is an answer, and that's what we're striving to try to find next. Uh, this is one of the most exciting projects, and this is the one that I'm doing right now, which is uh, a proposal for Genoa for the 1992 celebration of 500th anniversary of Columbus discovering America. And uh, it's in the harbor of Genoa, and uh, I could talk for hours about this, but I won't because I've already gone way beyond my five minutes that Paul allotted me. Next. But this is just some slight. Next. Go, let's go through this quick. Quick, 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 quick. That's it, Paul. I'm sorry I took so long. That's it. We'll be back in a moment as soon as the uh, stage magic is completed. Well, thank you, John, for beginning uh, with enough stuff to uh, keep us going really all night if, if we would wish to. Um, let me ask you uh, one question that picks up on something uh, you said in one of the earlier slides. Uh, you showed the Hyatt Regency atrium from uh, Atlanta, the original atrium hotel, and said that the atrium idea had been misunderstood. Can you tell us a little bit about what your idea was and how other people have misunderstood it? Uh, well, the idea, I never built a hotel before. I, uh, I approached the hotel problem uh, from the guest side of the registration desk. And uh, also, I analyzed the hotel from uh, the hotel as it exists as an entity within the central city. And uh, here I, I begin to do a, what, what I call a, a Kantian uh, analogy. Uh, Khan was very good at this kind of stuff. Uh, in saying, you know, uh, what is the essence of this? Or what, what exists here? And uh, in the Central City Hotel, and, and, a, and we had grown up where uh, Central Cities had become congested. And the whole idea of the atrium, and I've been, you know, I've been told uh, from so many people, including Philip Johnson, that, that the idea came from the Brown Palace. I've never been to the Brown Palace. Even know. now, still. Even you've never now, been to, the Brown to this Palace? day, I've never, I've never been to the Brown. I've seen pictures and books of the Brown Palace. I've never been to the Brown Palace. But really, how it came about was really. Uh, uh, came from saying, you know, what is a Central City Hotel? And if you analyze what existed, and you had to go back into those days, uh, it was a slab building 
uh, in the middle of a block or on the corner, it didn't matter. And you went in, it had a low ceiling lobby and it had a registration desk and it had a newsstand in one corner and a bar in another and a few club chairs sitting around and you went upstairs in a closed in elevator and uh, you got off on a dimly lighted, lighted corridor and uh, walked down the corridor and went into a cell, a room, which had a hole in the outside wall, which was a window, and you know, that was it. <clears throat> and I began to realize that, as, that what we were talking about was a city as it becomes more dense. And here we were building this hotel on, in, in the most heavily uh, trafficked area uh, in the city, and, and it was the most dense, and it was going to obviously continue to be that way and even grow more so in the future. And so what I started thinking of was in terms of can I, what can I do to do an antithesis to the congestion and to this uh, tight, uh, everything up until that time uh, really in central cities were tight. Uh, cell, everything was closed into cells, whether they were office buildings, apartment buildings. So I thought of the idea of exploding it. And um, I got in hooked into this idea of explosion and opening things up, pulling things apart and uh, what a central city really needed more than anything else was space. You know, it wasn't that it needed a great facade that came down to the sidewalk. Most cities, uh, uh, while there's nothing wrong with that, and everyone wants a great si a facade that comes down to the sidewalk, but what has happened over time as cities have uh, uh, densified, uh, on an antiquated infrastructure, the streets that existed there uh, in the old days, uh, which started out with a little one-story building on the corner, and, and then it goes down in two stories and three stories, and finally, and the infrastructure starts building, and finally it comes back and starts doubling back, and, and the buildings go up, but it only increased the infrastructure. They don't increase the public space. So the private space is constantly increasing and the public space stays the same. And uh, I felt this was wrong and I still feel this is wrong. Uh, uh, here, uh, you know, we get locked into this business of bringing the building down to the sidewalk, maintaining the facade, maintaining the line of the building. And the hell with that. What we're, what we're really missing is we're missing the fact that we've got to provide space for people to live and enhance the, the life of, the, of, of people. And uh, we've got to somehow find a way to solve the aesthetic problems as we go. But we've got to think in human terms, not just in physical thing terms. And so the whole idea of the atrium in the first place, I wanted a park, I wanted a, a not only a park-like space, but I wanted a space that when you walked in off of a busy s street with trucks and taxis and people, and, and you walked into something that you would almost feel it's a, like a resort. Uh, it, it, it is an antithesis to anxiety. It's a it has a feeling of serenity. And to open things up and pull things apart, take the elevator and pull it out of the wall let people experience the elevator ride, for instance. And it was this kind of thinking that led to the whole idea. And so it was uh, uh, really addressing uh, the evolution of the city. How has it been misunderstood? Then? I think it's been misunderstood because uh, it, it, it became uh, such an oh wow, you know, thing. Right. that people forgot about, uh, didn't go beyond the whys of the old wow, and uh, just started repeating the old wow. And uh, that's where it went off rail. I don't know if I should let you get away with the comment about never mind the street, never mind uh, the straight facade. 
why are they mutually exclusive? In other words, why can't you have the kind of monumental, exciting public interior space you're talking about and still have a building that respects the street, that enlivens the street, and so forth? Well, I think, and, and you know, and, and you've beaten me over the head with this, uh, the Marriott Marquis, for instance, uh, in the Marriott Marquis, which you started out as being uh, uh, very uh, pro True. Uh, back in uh, True. when, when I, I, yeah, I didn't come to New York to do the Marriott Marquis. Uh, 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 Mayor Lindsay came to me and asked me to come. To, you know, and, and, and the idea was that, hey, we've got a national heritage that's at risk. Uh, the sleaze factor is uh, uh, is going to really destroy uh, uh, the theater district. We've got to do something of a major uh, impact that will cause a catalytic effect to p push the sleaze factor back out and to preserve the theater district. And, you know, I got sucked in by all that. Uh, you know, I'm an idealist, really. I, I, I like to think that I'm a practical idealist. And but you're really just a country boy from the South yeah, at yeah, heart, yeah. right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's. So, uh, you know, a combination of Jack Robertson and, 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 and Mayor Lindsay working on me, next thing I know, I'm, I'm up to here in, in, uh, in trying to do this major thing in the middle of Times Square. And everybody's for me. New York Times is for me. I mean, everybody, you know. The theater was in desperate shapes. The actor's equity was for us. As a matter of fact, they wanted to make me Broadway Man of the Year. You know, can you believe that? And I, re I refused it. I said I, had, I hadn't done anything yet. I've just proposed something. I know, you know, wait till we do something, you know. I'm not going to accept it. We've just, I don't know whether we can do this or not. Uh, so I refuse it. <clears throat> That'll teach you, right? Yeah, it'll teach you. <laughs> so, you know, uh, going through the Beam administration and fighting and plowing money in and, you know, this Don Quixote and the windmills and all that stuff and God knows, you know, 14 years of all this and and finally, a guy who owns a, owns a, uh, a hotel next door, uh, which we had to have as part of the project, decides to hire a uh, public relations guy. And he goes out and, and he tells all these actors' equity people that, you know, you can't let these guys, they, they're tearing down three theaters. And uh, all the time, he's running the price up on this uh, uh, Piccadilly Hotel, which we had to have, which was four and a half million dollars. We ended up paying $16 million to get rid of that guy. And then he calls in the public relations guy, he's gonna call it off. He's gonna call it off after he's got uh, all these people up in arms and you know, and I'm turned from the knight in shining armor to the black hat guy. And uh, it's unbelievable, uh, you know. Uh, and, and being and believing you know, I needed to be in Times Square like a man needs a hole in the head. But <laughs> believing that I was making a contribution, believing, believing, because I am an idealist, practical. <laughs> believing, <laughs> believing that I could make a contribution and, got, and, and buying into that, uh, that thing that, you know, a national heritage is at stake here. We've got to turn this thing around. Okay, well, I, I got to tell you, Times Square is, uh, you know, is a, it looked like a war zone over there. But I'll never get credit for any of it. All I've gotten is scars and whips and beats and bumps and, you know, I'm the bad guy. I'm the bad guy. Uh, but but I, I got to tell you, if, if we hadn't done what we had done and it was allowed to deteriorate, and I got to tell you, uh, uh, I, I shelved this project during the boom, uh, then the, during the beam uh, period. I gave up hope. I said, you know, this is ridiculous enough. And, and then uh, Ed Koch came in and they came down and asked me to come back. And I said, oh no, not again. So, so I go back. And, 
crank the whole thing up all over again. And I want to tell you, Ed Koch stood by me, and if it hadn't been for Ed Koch, Ed Bowen wouldn't be there. <laughs> and the reason it wouldn't be there is because he had so much pressure put on him and he could have easily gone the other way. Uh, but he, he stood through the, and he took a, a hell of a lot of abuse. I don't know how you're doing, Ed, but I think you're doing great. Uh, I don't know how you people feel about Ed Koch, but I, I think he's a great guy. Uh, and I saw him fight for what he believed in when he could have easily gone the other way. I'm not here. I don't know if he's running for election or not, so I'm just passing through town. Uh, <laughs> but <clears throat> Helen Hayes was on our side, and Helen Hayes said, you know, Helen Hayes Theater is the worst theater. She said, that's an awful theater. You know, I had a three balcony thing. She, it's, you know, and I, own, I owned those three theaters for 10 years in the process. They lost money every year. None of them. I mean, we couldn't keep anything in there. And for anybody to, you know, excuse me for getting involved in no. all that, Paul. Go ahead. Go but, ahead. I mean, you know, it is so ridiculous. Uh, but uh, I got to tell you, so in in. Putting the, the marquee there and, and the whole idea, if there ever was a place where there was congestion, it's Times Square. My God, you can't even hardly walk for east and west, much less get a taxi and go. I've tried to go to Four Seasons for, uh, with a limousine from the, from the marquee and take 30 minutes to get over to Four Seasons, just going east and west. Why do you walk? I mean, that's ridiculous. I, yeah, you're right. <laughs> But I, I just want to tell you, if there ever was a situation where, you know, you have a maximum of absolute congestion, the sidewalks are jammed, the streets are jammed, everything's jammed. If there ever was a place where space was needed. So I wanted to raise the building up and free the ground space and add to the public space, add to the infrastructure, pull the buses and the taxi cabs and the things off the street. Free it up, let it breathe, and then create a space inside where people can come out of that congested mess and sit under a tree and have a cocktail and listen to music and enjoy themselves. And you know what? That hotel is financially the most successful hotel in American hotel history. And so one thing is right. A lot of people may not like it, but the people like it. And that's where I'm coming from. I'm for the people. Well. Um, and when you run for mayor with uh, <laughs> Mayor Koch, we'll remember that. Uh, all great, but I don't think you quite answered the question that got us into it in the beginning, which had to do with the whole question of the street and traditional urbanism. You said at one point that, in fact, when you were talking about your new tower for Atlanta, which I want to get into in a minute, but before we do, uh, you said actually some very, I think, convincing things about commonality of scale, form, materials, the desire to make an urban fabric, not to have buildings kind of stand apart and fight with each other. Uh, it, one of the reasons the Marriott at Times Square has been criticized is that it does seem to stand apart from other things. and there is not really much commonality of form or scale to what's around it. Paul, there was nothing there to relate to. Come on, what, what, you know, what am I gonna relate to? Howard Johnson's across the street? I mean, I, uh, it's ridiculous. I mean, you know, if you go back and analyze the environment, there was not, in San Francisco, we, we spent a lot of time trying to be very, very sensitive about how we related to that whole texture. Right. In Times Square, there was no texture. There was, well, any, there was nothing said, there. There was might nothing. Might said that there's only texture. Or no, too, there was or nothing there. Texture. Hey, I, you know, I've said yeah. Times Square was a skin game. I mean, you know, all it was was uh, shirt fronts. If you looked at Times Square, it was just a shirt front. You know, signs. Uh, you know, billboards and so, nothing behind. It had no substance. It was all surface. 
And what I wanted to do was to recognize that the character of Times Square certainly was surface. Don't take the surface away. Leave the surface, but add substance. And that was part of the whole thing. So I remember the original designs had a great deal more sort of concrete on the outside. And then as it was modified, there was more lights, more signs, more activity at street level. So that if someone actually were walking by, there was something to entice them. Which brings me actually to maybe a more central question about some of your large scale projects. Um, they've been occasionally criticized even by people who respect much of what you've done in terms of interior space for being too focused inward. In other words, the idea that, yes, John Portman loves urban activity and excitement and people, but only the sort of urban activity and excitement and people where he's created it and often turns his back or creates a wall between his creations and the existing city. Um, that's a comment that was made frequently about the Detroit Renaissance Center, the very large complex in Detroit. Um, perhaps you can talk a little more about Times Square and about some of the others and, and respond to that criticism. Well, I think, I, th I think anything taken out of context is, uh, uh, I believe that each situation has its own circumstance and the circumstance that if you seek the essence relating to those circumstances, leads to the solution that is unique to those circumstances in response to the circumstance at the time. And of course, as time moves on, and what, what you may do at one point in time, uh, you may respond to things, but the, the, the key to responding to a point in time and to sort of circumstances that exist in relationship to a point in time is uh, to do it in such a way that it can be open-ended and it can evolve and it can change and it can adapt as things change in the future. Oh, Detroit Renaissance. Detroit Renaissance uh, uh, was uh, isolated to begin with. I didn't have anything to do with that. The Ford Motor Land Development Company had had selected this property and it had separating it from the city a 13-lane freeway it had the tunnel from Windsor, Kansas, uh, Canada coming in and separating it on one side. It had the railroad tracks coming in and pinning it in on the other, and it had the river. Uh, it's an island. No, it is an island, sure. So it's isolated like that. So there, there was no context, really. It's, it was an isolated island. And uh, uh, what we had to do... Uh, Henry Ford came and asked us to, you know, Detroit was in a hell of a shape as it stays in most of the time. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's because of, uh, it, it has the problems of any one industry town. And uh, uh, the, the, the thing was that we had to do something there that would stop the outflow from downtown Detroit everything was heading for the suburbs and uh, to stop that uh, hemorrhaging and uh, <clears throat> we came to the conclusion that uh, we had to do something of a major a major thing that to go and do anything of a small scale uh, there's no way you're going to stop something of that magnitude and uh, it took a major major effort to stop to, to give an alternative to the suburban option of the people who were leaving the city. And uh, crime was very important. I checked into the Pontchartrain Hotel and, and uh, on, on one of my first trips there and they told me that, uh, look, you know, don't walk the streets. If you go to a restaurant, take a cab at the front door, go to the restaurant, come out of the restaurant, don't, don't walk, get a get a cab at the door of the restaurant, come back to the door of the hotel, and so forth and so on. Uh, frightening. You know, society is what really the kinds of, the kind of life that's out there uh, causes physical responses. I mean, back in the old days, they built castles and built moats, you know? 
and th that was the society. That was the life. And architecture and form responded to that. It didn't respond to something that, you know, some ideal romantic kind of thing that we have. You've got to recognize the real world as it exists out there. I mean, you know, I can't romanticize it into what I would like for it to be. What I've got to do is to recognize the reality of it all and to try to solve it at that point in time and to create a situation that can evolve into the future into what could be a romanticized ultimate end. But in the meantime, for it to live and succeed, you've got to take that first step and that first step has to recognize the realities that exist. So in effect, you really are um, agreeing, although you put a different value on it, with the description of it as a kind of fortress. There is no question that the greatest, you know, I went in Detroit, there was, I had a signboard when I was there, said, it's very easy to Monday morning quarterback. But the signboard said, with the last person leaving Detroit, please turn out the lights. I mean, it, it was a billboard. And uh, there, the, the fear, the fear, uh, uh, you talk about fear, f there, there's fear in urban America, in this city, in my city, in every city. And for us to deny that fear and deny that reality is just plain stupid. And uh, what we're trying to do in every way possible is hopefully that we're going to go through this horrible situation and find a solution to where we can create a civilization that, that, that fear recedes. But as long as fear is there, uh, we've got to create environments that recognize that fear exists. And the whole idea uh, in Detroit was because fear was so prominent uh, was to create something of such magnitude and of such force and uh, to create an option to save the city even though it was isolated from the city to begin with. We had master plans tying it back into the city with bridges across this 13-lane freeway. Uh, I don't know how you put shops along a 13-lane freeway and make and create these little romantic little restaurants and shops looking out on a freeway. I haven't figured that one out. Uh, you know, a, a lot of, but this unrealistic, this uh, this romanticized uh, view of uh, of the past and what the past means. We don't live in the past, you know. Uh, and the past probably wasn't all that great anyway. We live today and we want to make the best of what we've got to deal with today and hopefully, through what we do, create an opportunity to live better in the future and to offer a better existence for those who come behind us. But we'll never do that by romanticizing and being like the dodo bird looking backwards because we have fear of the future, and you know, and that's what I think about uh, uh, postmodern. Uh, you know, I, you know, it's. Uh, I think it's a negative approach. I think it's. Uh, it, it 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 it's it's a look back. It's a nostalgic look. It's an architecture of negativism. It has fear of the future, and the comfort of of those quaint things, you know, and let's go back and redo that. I mean, it's, it's crazy. You're not going to stop the evolution of man and you're not going to stop the evolution of time. What we've got to do is understand what's happening and how we can get out in front of it and control it and maybe direct it to make a contribution to the human existence. And, and that's where it is. It's not this knee-jerk reaction. The Atlanta He's building. speechless. No, I'm not speechless. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Atlanta building, that you, the new Atlanta Tower that you showed us a model of toward the end of your slide presentation, is very different from all the other works you've done. Uh, and it seems to me to be a tower that, in fact, acknowledges 
even as you criticize postmodernism, that you have listened to some of the things it's trying to say. Now, I talked early about, about coming through the Bauhaus period right. and, and this business of enrichment. And I think there's a, but if you analyze that very carefully, uh, there's nothing arbitrary about it. Everything is very pragmatically done and it's nothing arbitrary. There's nothing that's sacrificed uh, uh, my, uh, my belief in, in what the whole international movement was in trying to create more uh, for the masses and trying to create more uh, uh, through less and and having moved from the agrarian society the industrialized society of maximizing the machine and producing uh, in great quantities for all of us uh, and and understanding the economy of means and all of that and also the the uh, uh, the honest reflection of what is happening within a within a, a structure and 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 all of the there, but going beyond that and then uh, analyzing the enrichment and the basic fundamentals. When and I said back earlier that that people were telling us that modern architecture was coal. Was coal, for instance, we, we Mies had a plate glass wall and he had a, a plate glass door you know and that was the entrance there was no ceremony of entry there was no and and and, and actually uh, uh, the whole uh, feeling of uh, anticipation uh, and the ceremony of entry uh, as you go through uh, as you visit a place for the first time you 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 you're experiencing a sense of anticipation. And all that's wiped out if you s s grasp it all in a single glance and you go from nothing to nothing. I mean, so, so this whole period, I mean, this whole sequence of, of what happens to people. And, 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 and I must say that, that my whole philosophy has really been based on people and how people respond and to observing people in environmental circumstances of all kinds. And one of the most obvious to me and to all of you, uh, and there are many, many, but the one of the most obvious is the elevator. You get in a closed elevator and, everybody, and the door closes, everybody, uh, they'll look at their feet, they'll look at the ceiling, you know, they'll look at it. And you may be with a friend and you go on the elevator and you've been talking out here, you know, and you get on the elevator. All of a sudden you don't talk. You know, the conversation ends until you get off the elevator. And everybody there is doing this and doing this and doing this. And, doing this. and it, it's really a strange phenomenon. What has happened? A human being is moved into a closed box. The spirit is driven inward. You get on a glass elevator and it's amazing. The people continue to talk, conversations continue, and uh, it's, uh, nobody stands there. I mean, everybody's talking and pointing out things, you know. What, what's happening? The, the spirit has not been pushed inward. The spirit is moving outward. And so people feel free. And, and so I think, you know, it's basic fundamentals about how human beings respond to environmental circumstance. That's where architecture is because architecture is a public art. It's not a private art. It's not an elitist art. It sits out on the corner. It's in the public. It's for everybody. It's not for a select few. And for us to respond to that, then what we need to do is to spend more time trying to understand what it is that we can produce that will create the maximum enhancement in the human existence. And that's where it is. That's where we're trying to go, and that's, that's the basis of everything we've been trying to do. He's this, speechless. Now, this time, I am, this time I am speechless, because I think you've actually put it um, more articulately than I've heard you put that position before, in fact. Um, the whole question of popular taste versus elitist taste and, and the way it, it works in architecture. Um, 
But let me go back again to another point you made earlier when you talked about people over things, people more than things, and so forth. Uh, nobody could argue with a phrase like that. Uh, at least I don't imagine any architect with any degree of social responsibility would take issue with that. Uh, on the other hand, many of your buildings do seem to be notable for sort of immensity of scale, uh, often, you know, in immense walls, sometimes a sense of, uh, as, in, as in Los Angeles at the Bonaventure Hotel, of uh, being somewhat cut off from the city around, even though there's not a, a division as there is, a, a break as there is in Detroit, and so forth. Um, the the Peachtree Complex in Atlanta strikes me as perhaps the only uh, major complex of yours that really is closely and neatly interwoven into the existing street system. Uh, you've talked a lot about Louis Kahn and your admiration for him, which of course uh, I share. Kahn talked about the street as the supreme thing in urban design and once said the street is a room by agreement, um, which is a very beautiful and poetic phrase, I think. Uh, in Los Angeles, a building you didn't show, a very interesting complex of five glass towers. You wouldn't let me. Sitting on it. Well, you could have shown it fast. So, interesting <clears throat> complex of five round glass towers on a concrete base. Um, the building has many virtues, but one of them is surely not participating in that agreement about the street. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, as a matter of fact, in, in, in Los Angeles, uh, we had a garage. Uh, we were surrounded by garages on three okay. sides. Uh, there was no street life across the street. Okay. It, it, if you go and look, you'll no, see. No, no, I've been there. I've been there. And, uh, and, and then the, uh, 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 what's the Twin Towers there? That, Bank uh, of America? Uh, Bank yeah. of America Twin Towers. That, Arco, rather. Arco, Arco Towers. towers. Right. Uh, they turned their backs on the street, and uh, there was nothing on the street. So we had nothing on the street. Uh, what am I supposed to do? Go into the middle of this nothing on the street and create the whole damn environment in one fell swoop? I, and, 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 uh, and, and the other thing is that, that they were into tying uh, the, all of these garden levels together, uh, the Union Bank garden level, you know, and right. they wanted to, the, the Pays uh, World Trade Center thing, wanted to tie, and so they had this bridge concept which we bought into and that was part of it. Uh, and they had us, uh, the, I'm talking about the uh, uh, CRA, uh, Redevelopment Agency, they had this thing all figured out. <clears throat> They were wrong, uh, and we've tried to correct it, and we've even gone back to Security uh, Pacific, who has a garage across the way, and tried to get them to take away part of the garage and do shops and boutiques facing the street and all that. We've already opened up all around the street level, uh, and they forced us into an entrance. Uh, uh, I think on Flower Street, which was the wrong side, and nobody used that entrance, and that was our grand, everybody used the back entrance. And the people told us, just like on a campus, you know, people are gonna do what they're gonna do. You can draw these in, they'll go across the lawns. And finally, you decide what the people want, and you do what, the, you, you, you should really think about what the people want. But too often, we get into these abstract things, and we don't, we don't really get into that that much. We get lost in the thing of the thing and the abstractness of the thing and we forget about, hey, you know, what would I do as a little guy walking along down here and what would I really want? And, and I think that's missing. And we're trying to bring that back. We're trying to get it back to being really human oriented and, and trying to understand, you know, if we do this thing this way, how do I feel about it? And, you know, what 
What, what, what's going to happen here and what kind of effect is this going to have? And it really goes back to, to trying to understand, you know, this is what, something architecture never has done. You know, uh, you look into the motivations of what we talk about in architecture and the things we look up to and all this, and it's come down through history from the pyramids. Pyramid, you know, King used all his slaves to build these pyramids, put his body in there, you know, and all this stuff. And uh, it's a control of the masses. And so, and the religion came along to control the masses. And, and in Pope Julius's time, I mean, uh, they couldn't read. Uh, nobody, uh, very few people could read. Everybody was illiterate. And, and one of the way of controlling the masses was to build these big, enormous things. Everybody going so, ah, oh, you know. And, and it, it was a form of uh, political or religious control. Uh, but the motivations, and, and, and go to Haussmann in Paris. I mean, you know, uh, Paris plan is great and all that stuff, and it's turned out to be wonderful, but it wasn't really done that way for the people. What it was really done was these circles were designed on how far a cannon would fire, and they would take this rabbit warren, which was Paris, and carve it up into these little sections with these wide boulevards, and based on the cannon shots, and that if an insurrection starts here or a thing, they can circle it real quick and it can't spread. So uh, this great plan of Paris was really a political control thing. It didn't have a damn thing to do with the welfare of the people. Interesting that uh, if we uh, think about Detroit, we now have two analogies to fortresses, and um, you could also... I mean, I guess the problem we have with Detroit and the Renaissance Center, again, is if you think of Haussmann as wanting to control an insurrection, um, my concern about Detroit is it's almost designed as if the insurrection had already taken place and it was time to sort of barricade oneself inward. Well, um, uh, uh, you know, we, we put these berms along the 13-lane freeway and put all the mechanical system in there and and we had them designed so that vines would cover it and it would look like a bank of nature with trees on it, you know. And you would come off this and it knock out the sound of the freeway and you'd drive into this. And, and then we'd have this complex which we could control the environment. It's very, very difficult to create something desirable on a 13-lane freeway. I, I am figuring that one out, and and and, and we tried in, in that instance, and we had bridges, which were to be like the bridges in Italy, where they have these big wide bridges that go over the really freeway. streets with shops and everything. Shops in them, sure. and you park on this side of the freeway, you park on that side of the freeway, and you go up in there, and you know, so on, so on, so on. We had that designed. You know, nobody ever bothers to go back and look at the thing. It was designed to tie back into the city across and integrate back into the city uh, on the other side with housing all along the riverbank. Uh, of course, none of that was ever carried out. We and, made a tremendous difference, I think. And, uh, but, but the master plan uh, was dealing with all of that and trying to deal with all the traffic coming through the Windsor Tunnel and dumping right in the front door. Uh, we inherited that set of circumstances. And sure, it turned into a fortress, but Detroit, back in those days, needed a fortress. And uh, the people needed a fortress. And, uh, and they went in there, and you know, the only trouble came, you know, the taxi cab driver told me, and it really broke me up. He said, you know, he says, we let people off and they go in there, but they never come out. <laughs> <laughs> Let me, uh, great. Let me ask you about uh, a couple of more modest and small projects, um, like uh, the Portman Hotel in Atlanta. Uh, I mean, in, in um, San Francisco, Francisco rather. Right. Uh, I mean, that too seems to be an attempt. While obviously you were not interested in doing historicism, uh, you were doing some of the things that the postmodernists 
claim that they too are doing or advocate, which is some uh, similarity of vocabulary of materials, of scale, of active external texture. Uh, there's a tremendous difference to me in the Portman Hotel and some of your earlier work in that the activity there is not only turned inward, there's also an enormous amount of uh, visual interest to somebody who just happens to be passing by in a car or walking by. Uh, whereas uh, many of the projects, uh, you must go inside to see what you were getting at. While if you go into the Portman Hotel, you see more of what you were getting at, uh, you don't miss the entire thing if you simply go by. There's still, there's still gestures to the street and to the city. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I, 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 I plead guilty to being uh, uh, more concerned about the substance of a building than the surface of a building. Uh, just like if I was a writer like you, I would be more interested in the substance of the book than the cover of the book. But is, is exterior uh, and interior analogous to sub surface and substance? Uh, well, so I, 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 what I, what I'm saying is that that I'm an inside-out man. Uh, and a lot of people that uh, are outside in, you know. Uh, as long as it looks nice and they can get a good photograph of it, they could care less about what the hell happens inside. But the people really live, you know, we're building, we're building space. You know, what is, our, what is architecture? Architecture is space. And what is space? Space is for the use, it, 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 it's, it's for all of our, uh, it's for all of us, and it's for the use of the space. And, and, and I happen to feel that, uh, to me, uh, the, the living part of the thing is the thing that really interests me most. Uh, and so maybe I do dwell more, and that's why I say I, I, I'm an inside-out man. I think about how people are going to live in a space, whether it's in a, in a single room or a bigger room or whatnot, or how the whole thing thing, more so than that fleeting moment that I might pass by and look at a facade, I, I, I think, uh, unfortunately, that, that we think too much in relationship to facade and not enough to substance. And uh, something can have a very, you know, I'm interested in having a great facade like anybody else. I mean, I love facades. You know. but, but it doesn't end there. Uh, it's like your facade, you know? I may not like your facade, but if I get to know you, I may find that you're a pretty nice guy. Uh, <clears throat> but, but, but really, it's the substance of the, it, 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 it's, you get into form and substance. I'm, I'm, I'm only facade, so I have no. <laughs> um, but, but, but it's, it's form and substance. And what is architecture? It's form and substance. You know, the form is important, but also the substance. Uh, you can't be overly preoccupied with either. And I think it's a very delicate balance that is going to make something that's really meaningful and lasting and, and, and making a contribution if it is a wedding of these two concerns in, an, in a balanced way. But if you get so carried away with how, you know, we pull this thing out here, you know, boy, gee, gee, that's going to look great. You know, we'll do this, you know, that's going to look... And you, and you don't know, you know, and, and what it's doing to the inside is, oh, well, you know, nobody cares. It's going to look great in a photograph on the front page of a magazine. I mean, that's, that's uh, sophomoric. What, what we're really talking about is people. We're not talking about things. What we're talking about is people and how people respond to environmental circumstances and what we do when we create things and force them, thrust them. And that's why I say architecture is an imposition art because we're forcing it on people. Uh, let's make it something that they're going to be glad to be have put upon and uh, them. And, and, and I, 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 don't, I, I think that uh, when we get into this 
romanticized thing, and I mentioned, you know, the sidewalk and the building line and all that, you know, that's important. But also density, infrastructure, public space, private space, how the human being reacts, what does it contribute. You know, there's so many things that must be taken into consideration instead of, gee, gee, that's a great line there. And, you know, this, you know, something. I mean, that is so shallow. It just upsets me terribly. It's getting a little warm in here. I think I'll remove my <laughs> facade, actually. <laughs> um, yes, but you could read it another way. Um, you could also say that a building like the Portman Hotel is entered by, I don't know, a thousand people a day, but passed by 50,000 people a day. So shouldn't one be concerned about even the brief impression of those 50,000 as well as the detailed impression of the 1,000 who go in? It really is serving both, and why is it an either-or proposition? I didn't, why say, isn't it both? I didn't say that. I said it's okay. a wedding of both. Okay. I said it's an equal concern of both. Uh, but if I have to choose between the two, the guy that's going to spend 30 seconds going by it uh, is not as important to me as the guy that's going to live in it. I think the guy that's got to live in it is more important to me than the fleeting <coughs> moment of someone passing by. I mean, he's going on somewhere else and so on. But that guy who's got to live in it, he's the guy I'm concerned. I want, him, I want to make a contribution to him. And, and I think that's important. Okay, good. Uh, let's spend the last few minutes that we have turning to uh, all of you for a few questions, if, if there are any. Um, as the lights slowly go up, we can see some people. Uh, are there any? Uh, yes, sir, right here. There are some extensions on the front of the Merritt Marquis that look like they're splintered to the skyways across the street. Are those narrow actually the same as the ones that are on the street? The question is uh, I'll repeat the question. Uh, there are some extensions in front of the Marriott Marquis and Times Square that look as though they were intended to be skyways to go across the street. Is that so? No. No. What, what that was intended to be was to express the fact that uh, since we had the, the Midtown Planning Office, which was a major part of what happened along the street, and the, and the fact that we had the box office on the street and we have to go up es escalators and, and uh, the whole idea of having to pull the theater up because of the subway beneath and the vibrations and the sound and all of that, uh, the the as the escalators go up is to pull that out to emphasize the circulation and to emphasize that this is an entry point and uh, that not not as a uh, an extension to go across the street that theater is actually uh, strikes so, me as one of the few new theaters that has actually worked very well best theater in new york city well, I'm okay. saying that, and I'm, I'm saying that unabashedly because it has the best sight lines. It is a 1,600-seat seat theater, which feels like maybe a seven or 800-seat seat, uh, seat theater. It's very intimate. The acoustics are absolutely spectacular. The sight lines are spectacular. It is absolutely the best theater in, in, in New York. Uh, the Schuberts will be happy to hear you say that. Um, no, it, it is certainly it is the only one of the new generation of theaters that has not been criticized by theater professionals. They I love think, it. Yeah. They love it because you, you know you really almost don't need uh, uh, things like this uh, because of the acoustics. And we spend a lot of time. I had I had. Paul in the, in the model shop one day, and I told him, I said, it's going to be the best goddamn theater in New York. He laughed. <laughs> He's still laughing. No, He's still I didn't. laughing. <laughs> He's still laughing. Didn't say but, no, I just but, 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 but I really uh, tried, to, uh, uh, tried to really 
figure out how, and really very difficult, because in, in, on Broadway, uh, the small houses can't survive. If you build a new house, you've got to build it big enough uh, to where it can justify its existence. And the, the problem of building a big house is how do you build a big house and not make it feel like a big house? Uh, such as the one next door. The Minskoff, the, the yeah, Minskoff, which feels like a convention feels hall. like a, you know, it's uh, yeah. some big ballroom. Uh, and, and so this whole idea of how, uh, how, to, how to put the thing together in such a way to maximize this, the acoustics and the whole theater experience uh, became something that was really a, a, a challenge. And... and uh, I can only tell you that the actors and the producers and everyone tell us, you know, they love it. They love it. And uh, the audiences apparently do too. And the play is still running, which is and not The play so bad, is still yeah. running. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir, in the back. Oh, oh uh, I meant the president of the way back. You'll be next, okay? Yes, sir. Uh, it's an interesting question, actually. The, the questioner was saying that he centers a conflict between us on the whole issue of uh, streets versus piazzas and other kinds of public places, uh, and can't we get together more, um, to boil it down to its essence. Uh, I don't think we have a conflict that I would define in those terms. I think we've disagreed about the extent to which um, John Portman's urban activity in his buildings, which I very much like, um, is exclusive and separate from the existing urban activity in the existing city that surrounds it, um, and whether or not they can be more directly integrated. He's explained that there were historical circumstances, particularly in Detroit and to some extent in Los Angeles, that made that difficult. And in fact, I did point out that I think in Atlanta it works very naturally San and very Francisco well. San Francisco too. And San Francisco works pretty well too, that's right. Um, the, I mean, the, the city market street just kind of flows into the complex and back out again. Uh, given that, I know you and I have talked about this, we both have tremendous admiration for the original core of Rockefeller Center. Yeah. Uh, which I, I remember once writing that you were the only architect in America who'd actually consciously studied and learned from. Uh, I don't know that we really have that much of a conflict. Uh, I certainly believe that piazzas play a tremendous role. They've just got to be well-defined. They can't be simply leftover space. They have to be uh, defined, meaningful space. They have to be, in effect, outdoor rooms not simply seas of concrete that are just left over uh, or are just there to set off a building. They must have uh, meaning in themselves as positive spaces, not just leftover spaces. I think, I, I think really, if I were, were to idealize it, if I could take New York and, uh, and crossbreed it with Savannah, Georgia, <clears throat> If any of you are familiar with the plan of Savannah, uh, it's probably one of the most, one of the best city plans uh, that I know of anywhere, uh, where blocks are set apart as parks, and these blocks are intermingled uh, with development. And uh, and when I say marrying New York, New York with its uh, grand urban uh, parks, uh, Central Park, and the combination of that grand Central Park with, a, uh, with an interspersing of, uh, of these block parks uh, through a highly urbanized area. But Central Park is, you know, in one place and, and the density and the congestion and everything stacks up and stacks up and goes further and further away. And, and uh, 
uh, it can only do so much. Uh, and I've often wondered if you could take all that space and rearrange it. <laughs> but but I, I think that uh, uh, you, what we're really talking about is, is public and private space. Uh, that's what a city is. A city is composed of public and private space. Uh, the sidewalk, the streets, uh, the parks, the public areas. Uh, if you go into an office building, you go into an office, that's private. You go into a hotel room, that's a private space. Uh, but the minute you leave those private spaces and hit the elevator and go down and you enter the public arena, but what's been happening in our cities is that our private space has been building up and up and up and up and up and up and up. And our public space is, is the same. Uh, very little has been done. Now in San Francisco where we, uh, the whole idea behind the San Francisco uh, Embarcadero Center plan in those uh, five city blocks was that <clears throat> I wanted to multiply the public arena. And so I had the street level, the intermediate level, and what we call the podium level. We didn't start the private space until the fifth level. We took this whole podium level and ran it through five blocks, which really created a pedestrian village at the base of all this private space. So you come down into a village. You don't come down in, into a, an elevator lobby and walk out and you're on the sidewalk next to the buses and the, and, and the elbowing and all that. And, and, and what we need really is an understanding of a strategy uh, to improve the public space uh, in our cities uh, uh, as we become more and more dense and we keep loading the infrastructure that we have uh, it, it reached a breaking point, and, it, and uh, uh, it's not a desirable living place after a while. And this is why people finally leave cities. You know, in a free society, you can't make people do anything. People are going to do what they want to do, not what you want them to do. And so the trick is, how can you create a set of circumstances that people do what you want them to do, which happens to be in, in the best interest of all of us, but not because you want them to do it because it's in the best interest of all of us, but because they end up doing it because it's what they want to do. And it's, you got to start thinking that way uh, if you're going to make something really happen. Good. Next, the gentleman who, we, uh, who didn't finish a moment ago. Yes, sir. Well, you know, we're, housing was the question. I guess I guess that we're we're no more for hotels because of this spectacular nature of the physical thing, uh, but we've been involved in in all sorts of things going far beyond ha uh, hotels. Uh, <clears throat> in Embarcadero Center, for instance, they did the Golden Gateway project first which was a housing. And it was a financial disaster and it almost, you know. And we came in later and we did Embarcadero Center, which was the commercial and the job-based thing. And I think that, that uh, in, in, in our situation, for instance, in, in Atlanta, we've been building the job base uh, core first instead of going the other way around. You know, get somebody who works in the suburbs who's going to drive into town uh, to go home. They just, I mean, for some reason that won't work. Uh, what you have to do is to build the job base in the inner city and build that uh, customer base, and then you build the housing. So we are in the housing right now. We are in the study of housing uh, uh, in connection with Peachtree Center. Uh, as an extension, and uh, we've had uh, feasibility studies, uh, both local and national, to tell us uh, as much as we can. Uh, we have not uh, uh, 
entered housing, except in our Shanghai project, we are doing, we've got housing there, but it's a very special kind of housing. Uh, but we are just now beginning to go from these commercial complexes, uh, which become what I call coordinate units. What is a coordinate unit? You know, I believe that uh, cities should all be developed into what I call coordinate units. That is based on how far man will walk before he thinks of wheels. You know, in this country, a man will walk, believe me, a man will not walk over seven to 10 minutes before he's thinking of wheels. And uh, if it's a 15 minute walk, he ain't gonna walk, he's gonna get some kind of wheel. So you, you, you ask yourself, okay, uh, uh, if the seven to 10 minute walk, and what is that time, space, distance? And then how can you do a radius and, and design a coordinate unit where this can become a pedestrian village where people can uh, really live and do uh, all the ordinary things of life that we all need to do uh, without having to seek wheels. Uh, we're, you know, we spend half our lives with the wheel. Uh, certainly uh, in, in smaller cities of America and uh, nobody walks anywhere anymore. Uh, but if uh, you don't walk to the Kona drugstore, you don't walk to church, you don't walk to school, you don't walk to the dentist, you don't walk to this, you don't walk, you don't walk anywhere. We don't walk. You know, everything now is wheel oriented. And uh, the idea of, of, of developing, and even the suburbs, and we're doing a suburban development, which, and I went and analyzed the suburbs and the development of the suburbs. And my God, everything is fragmented. You got uh, office parks over here. You got shopping centers over here. You got warehouse districts over there. You know, you you have four rush hours in the suburbs in this country. You have one in the morning, one before lunch, one after lunch, and one going home. They spend half their time getting in and out of the car and parking. I mean, that's that's a crazy. And so what we're trying to do is to is to say, hey, you know, we're biped creatures. Uh, what kind of environment should we have? And uh, to try to design an environment that really puts people back on their feet and gets them out from under the steering wheel. Think of the energy savings, you know, if you don't have to get out and uh, burn. And think of what it'd do to the environment if we could cut all those motors off. But, you know, it, it, and it makes so much sense. Uh, but we haven't done that. We've, we've fragmented and we've gone in all directions and there's no sense to any of it. Good. We have time for one or two more. Yes, sir, in the back. I mean, I'm sure you could go and find wonderful examples of any kind of circumstance you want to find. Uh, but what is the reality of the situation? The reality is uh, is somewhat different than maybe. For instance, you talk about the bridges uh, uh, in Atlanta. Uh, you know, our cities are made up of blocks. My favorite city in all the world, I guess, is Venice. You know, there are no automobiles in Venice. You can't walk on water, and a hell of a lot of bridges there, and it's an incredible, wonderful, human 
pedestrian environment. And uh, I think that our cities, we have uh, not canals, but we have vehicular rivers. And our blocks are isolated islands. And what we've tried to do is to say, if we're going to compete with the suburbs, where they go out and they have all the land in the world, they don't have these traditional infrastructure blocks, and uh, they can do anything they want, and uh, they've got trees and birds and all this stuff. And uh, so our cities are under attack. The only way we can uh, sustain the cities is to try to create an environment uh, that people want to be a part of. And in order to do that, I want to tie the blocks together and uh, take these land masses. Uh, in Atlanta, for instance, we have huge blocks. In New York, you got 200 by 800 foot blocks. We have 400 by 400 foot blocks and 400 by 500 foot blocks. Huge blocks which traditionally had been lined with the sidewalk with uh, small buildings and whatnot, and the core of the block uh, was for the trucks and the garbage cans and the service delivery, and the whole, the mass of the thing was, and everybody was relegated to the street and the sidewalk. And uh, I've said, that's wrong. Uh, I said, what we've got to do is to take this land mass and integrate the land mass, tie these blocks together in a pedestrian way where people can flow without having to uh, fight the traffic and uh, everything that goes along with that and open up these huge interior spaces and create uh, park-like settings, uh, interior and exterior, places of serenity so people can sit under a tree and read a book and have a a brown bag sandwich, uh, you know, whatever. But to create these people places and to maximize the use of the space. And at the same time as we do that, and it's a two-stage process, it's a process of maximizing the interior of the landmass. But then once you do that, then it's come back and energizing the edges. And that's what we're involved in right now in Atlanta is energizing all the edges uh, we've redesigned the Plaza Hotel, which has opened up on two streets now. And back in the old days, it was very much of a fortress-like uh, thing at street level. Uh, we now have shops, and, uh, and we've opened it up all the way around on the sidewalk level. We've also taken and uh, uh, developed a uh, streetscape uh, throughout the whole project. but. The first thing we did in the first step was to create and maximize and energize the interior and then move back to the street. And then because of the strength of the interior, it allowed us to come back to the edges and start working on the edges. So it's not that you, 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 you take one or the other. What you really want is both. Okay. Um, yes, the lady in white. You were doing fine until the last remark. Uh, uh, the, the, the idea to Marriott Marquis, uh, after standing on those street corners and observing uh, the incredible congestion, uh, and, and, and here we're going to come into the middle of that congestion and put a 2,000-room hotel, and it was like Detroit. And we had everybody in New York, and it's a true story. All the hotel people said, you're crazy, you know, nobody. 
a hotel never succeed in Times Square with all that uh, stuff around it. I mean, you know, you'll never get a guest over there and all that, you know. It just so happens that the Marriott Marquis is the most successful uh, hotel in American hotel history. That is a fact. And uh, just recently I was at a function here in New York where all the hotel people were in and uh, the same people who told me that this is Portman's folly and this is ridiculous, you know, you're dumb, you're crazy, you can't build a hotel over there. They come up now, they say, well, you know, it ought to be a success. It's right in the middle of the, hotel, uh, the theater district. You know, well, hell, anybody knows it'd be a success. It's right in the middle of the, right in the, middle of the theater district. But, you know, it's great to Monday morning quarterback, but to get back to your question, I wanted to open up the base of the building and I stood down there one one morning, and uh, people coming in from the subway and from the bus terminal over there, and and seeing swarms of people just walk through the underside of the building, uh, tells you something. I mean, you know, it's such a relief to have this this open space in Times Square and to get cars off the street and to, to let things happen. Can you imagine a 2,000 room hotel sitting there with taxi cabs, buses, service and everything trying to serve off those streets with that congestion? It's, it's, that's insanity. I mean, you know, so, so what needed to happen there is to lift the building up, open it up, try to energize the edges uh, uh, and create uh, an openness and an activity area and take the basic, if you're going to come to the hotel, you're going to register, if I'm going to put you on the 21st floor, it doesn't make any difference, you're going to go to the 21st floor. Main thing, I don't want the registration there, down there in that precious area. I want to get it up out of the way and get the people up quick and to not let that get congested. It's already congested. So putting them up on the eighth floor and putting all the public space from the eighth floor down and all the private space from the eighth floor up uh, and creating that huge open space, almost park-like, and to go up there and sit under a tree and listen to Broadway tunes and have a drink in the middle of Times Square is marvelous. And it must be marvelous because the people love it and it's crowded and it's making a hell of a lot of money. All right, uh, one, one more I think we have time for if it's a fairly quick one. Uh, yes, in the back. I was wondering about your project in China and Moscow, whether you approach them in the same manner as you might approach them in American cities, keeping them as fortresses for the Western world, and how you might integrate East and West together and try to help people out. Well, uh, they're open. They're not fortresses. The whole base is open. Uh, the, host, the whole street, uh, the whole land mass is open, and it's a really a kind of a retail village-like thing at the base. And then only uh, when you get to about the fourth floor up does it uh, begin to get into the other functions. Uh, so we bring the city in. However, uh, the whole purpose uh, of the thing is to, was designed to begin to be a stepping stone from west to east. And uh, in order to do that, there's no housing in, there's no housing in Shanghai. Uh, if uh, Chase Bank wanted to go and uh, open an office, they got to open an office They've got to send people there, and then it, they've got to find a place for their people to, to, to live. And uh, it's a whole series of things. And, and what this is designed to do, whether it's a German company, a French company, Italian, American, or whatnot, it's the Western world, is to provide uh, an entry point where they can come in, they can have a small office. We have the housing for the personnel and they can begin to understand uh, the, the environment and understand uh, uh, and, and ease into a growth position. 
The, and the idea is that they will move from this incubation point out and do their own thing and then somebody else comes in. Uh, but it's a first step in the evolution of the, the redevelopment of China. And it, it, is, uh, uh, it has been received so well that we have been invited now to do something similar in Moscow. And we're having conversations now about a similar project for, for Russia. We could go on and on. I think we've really only touched on some of the issues that this work raises. And uh, I hope, John, you'll come back at some point and let us, let us continue. For now, thank you all for being here. And please join me in thanking thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.